My name is Steph Scagliola. I work at the Erasmus University until next week. Then I'm moving to Luxembourg University and I'm a specialist in opening up oral history collections. Um, my, I learned it on the job. Uh, my first um, big scale project was the Dutch interviews project, which meant uh, bringing together a thousand audio interviews with a representative number of um, veterans of war and military deployments, interventions. And um, it was the first digital, large scale digital board archive. And I assumed uh, I would receive uh, requests from very greedy anthropologists, sociologists. Instead, I got a bunch of very greedy speech technologists, <laughs> uh, a computer scientists who wanted to do all kinds of things with this audio archive. And that's how I was, I, I, I just stumbled into the, 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 the realm of the digital. Um, I, the, the insights from that project were brought um, to the next project, which is post of Voices, which is two collections of video oral history, uh, one in Croatia and one in Bosnia, uh, with transcri transcriptions, full transcriptions in, in two languages. So for, without um, mastering the, the local la language, you have access to primary sources of first-person testimonies. And, um, and there are life stories that go back from the Second World War until the War of the 90s. A third project is called War Love Child. And this was a, a community building project, which consisted in uh, creating a community around a very controversial topic, namely the children fathered by Dutch military during their deployment in Indonesia, during the decolonization war. And um, we created a website where people with their names or anonymously could just post stories and upload uh, photographs and um, uh, have a kind of uh, recognizing stories from each other. And through this website, we collected, we created a community and we presented the website at gatherings, at special gatherings. And so we traced the people involved in these kind of matters and then we contacted them and interviewed them. And on the basis of this information, uh, a colleague of mine created a beautiful documentary, a theater maker, a theater piece, and myself and my colleague, we wrote a book about this, this topic. Um, but in this context, this is our reference frame. I hope you all recognize the Excel file which has been sent to you uh, with the very ambitious goal of creating um, a registry of um, oral history collections in various European countries. Well, in light of what has been said up to now about the importance and the relevance and the possibilities of applying technology to open up this content to multiple disciplines, you can imagine that if you look at the themes that are represented in these different countries, you see the Dutch, the German, UK, France, and it's far from complete and we really hope you will help, help us in completing it. In that context, it's, it's very logical that there is a, an enormous richness of comparat comparative potential in a variety of themes between different European countries. And I hope I'm, uh, I'm not being nostalgic when I present this from the perspective of Europe, of a united Europe. <laughs> um, so um, if, if, I look at the, if I look at European history and the value of oral archives, uh, my reference frame as a historian is the process of nation building in the 19th century, which is actually the history that we are accustomed to is a history mainly based on the accumulation of written and printed sources, which was the result of three centuries of printed and written sources which, how do you say, which, which um, came together in the 19th century, in the century in which uh, nations were formed, nationalism, national archives, and for the national archives, in fact, the written sources are the building stones for nation building. 
um, we are entering a completely different era with a shift, with a, a presumed shift in the, in the balance of scale of sources. And this is a progressive study of IBM, which shows um, how on the web, uh, the, in the future um, decades, the balance between the kinds of information is going to change. Well, I can see a, a big uh, potential for oral history sources, for speech in general, within this context, because it means that there is a shift of sources from which you can derive information about human behavior, about human expression. And in the light of, uh, of, of this shift, um, you can also think of the fact that in the 20th century, we had an enormous accumulation of uh, recorded sound and speech, as opposed to textual, written text. And, and this is, and of course, we now also have social media. And uh, you can see that uh, projects are, are, are emerging in which all these kinds of sources are brought together. And this is also what technology can do to us. It could give us the opportunity to look at uh, European television history in context. We're, we're old enough to do that now. <laughs> and it's going to be more and more in the future. If I look at oral history as a sub-domain uh, within audiovisual sources, um, and I look at Europe, and I've, I've, I've gone through all these collections which are in this preliminary registry, and then um, the main themes are these. And they, they kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of neck, they have nexuses to all kinds of different disciplines. You have political movements, human rights abuses, which the, um, imagine that the traditional conventional oral history archives that relate to war are very much connected to national warfare, the First World War, the Second World War, nations going into war. If you look at the context of oral history at present related to war and conflict, it's all about um, civil war, it's, and, and it's very recent. You, ha you have online now a Syria oral history project. You have an Eritrea oral history project. So the time span between the actual event and the testimonies, the witnesses, is, is, is becoming shorter and shorter. And this is also consequences uh, for the blurring between journalism and history. So these are very important um, developments, not only in the in the, in the context of reflection in retrospective, but also in the context of uh, disciplines coinciding, coming together, and, and uh, rethinking what the borders are between academic reflection and methodology and uh, easy to use technology for representation. And it, it's blurring very much. And I think it's one of the, the issues that confuses academics. I, I make a website, or I do a PhD on the website, and how catchy does it have to be? Does it have to be tough? Because it's an academic paper. So you all have all these kinds of considerations. So um, healthcare is a very important one. Reminiscence, studies, narrative psychology. Uh, custom and traditions shows the very strong link to folklore studies, language studies, daily lives. Um, and migration, and this is this is a, a very important uh, American tradition. Elite celebrities, the Columbia Oral History Project started with interviewing important people because the important people stopped writing letters to each other and used the telephone more and more. And so this was the incentive to start. And the reason they started with important people is because they got the money to interview important people. <laughs> Um, I've tried to make a world all of the, um, the titles of all these collections, but um, the option you have on internet doesn't permit to take out all the redundant stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but what is striking is that the real markers are the Shoah, and here you have Ravensbrook, and that's a real, how to say, when you talk about oral history, 
And sometimes that is a bit frustrating. Uh, it seems as if the exceptional is dominant. Whereas if you think of what we experience in our daily lives, war is an exception. <laughs> so there is a kind of juxtaposition between what is regarded as relevant and interesting as an academic topic of study and what is actually the social representation of reality. And there is a, a, a big tension in that. If you think of, if you legitimize oral history as a source of knowledge for social representation, you have to be aware, very aware of this tension. Um, what are the characteristic oral history? Uh, Jake has already touched on it. I want just some subtle, um, the orality tone and volume. So please listen. Even if it's a snippet of two, three minutes, it will give you new ideas. Don't, don't uh, limit yourself to text. I, I, I'm, I, I hear the echo of your, oh, please not MP3, please laugh. <laughs> Anyway, but I, I have the same with listening because it really is um, performance, a background, the style of speech, um, subjectiveness. In traditional positive history, subjectiveness is a problem. In oral history, it's the subject, it's the core, it's what you want to know, what people have done with their experience, the words that they've chosen to express it. Um, narrative structure, the organization of narrative, who is not mentioned, who is mentioned over and over again, and why. Um, Co-creation, um, contrary to memoirs, this is something that is created in co co collaboration with some type. A different person with a different gender, different skin color, different dress, gets a different interaction and gets different information. And um, changing memory. Uh, and this is what also, also Jacob uh, referred to. Uh, people change the relation, the terminology to relate, to reference to certain events changes. And so memory changes. Um, who are the, in, in which realms are first person narratives used? Well, in the community building, ah. I missed out the history. I don't know whether that was unconscious. Community building, folklore languages, phonetics, um, social sciences, and here uh, health studies is supposed to be, and in journalism. Um, there are three different uses of the oral history source. Um, one is the one in which it's complementary and equal to a textual source. So it's giving voice to underprivileged. And here you have the written archive. And at the side, you want to complement the voids in the written archive. That is one interpretation of the oral source. And a representative of um, this uh, kind of oral history, which comes from social history, is Paul Thompson, the founding father of the British oral history. And uh, I have a interviewed uh, um, a commander of a brigade in the Falklands, Mr. Julian Thompson, who is always to be found in the Imperial War Museum. He's written extensively. And he has uh, some comments on what the use of oral history is. And I want you to share that with you.
Okay. That was Major Dudon, who is, a, who is a typical representative of the oral source being weighed by the expert as complementary to the written source. A completely different perspective on the value of oral history is oral history as a process of meaning, of creating meaning. And this, um, this grew out of the cultural turn in the 1980s with uh, written text not being just text as such, but having subtext and different interpretation. interpretation. And um, a representative of uh, this, this interpretation of oral history is a, a quite famous uh, methodologist, Alessandro Portelli. And um, his take on this is that um, what is factually wrong can be psychologically true. So the, the, the interest and that comes very strongly from cultural studies and literary studies, the interest is in what people do with these stories. And if these stories don't correspond with other sources, it is an indication of the process of meaning making. And that is then the purpose of the analysis, to see what people do, how they create meaning. So subjectivity is not a problem. Subjectivity is the goal. And, um, and in that sense, what could be a problem for Major Thompson is some is enrichment for Alessandro Portelli. And um, here we have a small YouTube clip in which he, Alessandro Portelli, tells us something about the importance of the uh, Well, I'm, I'm going to start at the beginning. Prove that it's a fact by and so ultimately the procedure, the criterion of scientific research uh, is the, the one thing we need to agree on. Then, of course who decides what is a fact and what isn't. That's political. That's political. But then, uh, uh, then we need to prove that it's a fact by as objective a procedure as possible, which is never 100% objective. But again, we're striving that's a utopia of, uh, of an objective analysis of subject. <laughs> Take subjectivity as a fact and try to analyze it. I mean, there's such a thing as psychoanalysis, psych uh, psychology, and things, you know, all these things. So, uh, so, how do you explain the fact that there are multiple narratives? It's democracy. It's democracy. And, uh, and some of these narratives are more credible than others. Some of these narratives are more useful than others. But you know, the attempt to, and we've been through that in Italy in the 90s, to have a shared narrative that we all can agree on. That's authoritarian. That's undemocratic. We need to be able to agree on the procedures, on the methodology, and then quarrel about the narratives and possibly have peaceful and democratic ways of disagreeing on you know, <laughs> the So I think this is, and the other thing is, you know, the great, but that's a wonderful question. What's the right time to publish your story? There's no such thing as the right time. The right time is now when you have it. The point is, that oral history is always a finish. Uh, number one, because of course people change, stories change. Uh, I mean, I did, you know, the, the event that moved me, that brought me to oral history was a strike in death in 1953. 2004, there was another strike. They did exactly the same things, the same actions. What had changed? language. 
1953, they thought that fighting against layoffs in the factory, dismissal, was part of a struggle for a better future. In 2004, there was no such thing as the future. The struggle against the, defending their jobs was a struggle for survival, not a struggle for a better world. And that came out in the words, in the language, not in what they did, because it was exactly the same. Picket lines, roadblocks, beating up, some uh, and also, the audiences change. Uh, Marisa Musu, who was one of the fighters in the underground resistance as well, talks about how, you know, she said, you would talk about resistance in schools in the 70s, and they would ask you, where'd you get the weapons? What was the strategy? But you talk about it in the 90s, and kids ask you, were you afraid? Did you want to die? And one of the, my only real contribution to history of resistance in Italy was the fact that I was the first one that realized that after the resistance was over, the partisans married one another. So here is uh, Alessandro's take on what matters in oral history. Um, this is his classic books about the meaning of our history. Um, the, now the digital dimension. What, what is the added value of the digital dimension to the oral history archive? Uh, well, here you can see all the trans, trans, uh, transmissions of, of transitions from one technology to the other. And if we go to the, um, to the potential, the digital potential, I can see three main um, added values. The potential to link, to connect, and to analyze. When I'm talking about linking, I'm talking about the possibility um, of an interview with a transcript, with all kinds of entities, named entities, places, to be connected to the new reels of Croatian men and to the list of missing persons. And this is one of the interviews we have from Croatian Memories, which is accessible online. And this creates the possibility to connect heterogeneous sources, the sources that Jakob was talking of in, at the beginning of the talk. So linking heterogeneous sources gives you a richness and saves a lot of time. The second one refers to community interactivity with an audience, which is immediate. So your audience is a potential contributor to your historical product because you can publish an oral history and people can comment on it or they can add photographs to it. And there is a huge difference between the open space where everybody can do anything and you have a lot of nonsense and a controlled space which is curated and accompanied by people who are specialized in creating such a community. Um, the third uh, potential is analyzing. Analyzing, and that's, it. that's in, in the second phase of the research process, the analysis process. And one of the things that is interesting about oral history is its multi-layered content. It's multi-layered. It was so when we had the audio and the text. But now that we also have video oral history, it has incredibly been enriched with, with a lot of extra layers. And um, these are, for instance, the dimensions that you can take out of the, out of the video oral history. And um, we have done some uh, explorations in this field. With the veterans interviews, um, we created um, a group of uh, researchers from different disciplines. We offered them 25 interviews. And we said, please write an article on the basis of these sources from your perspective, using your methodology. And this resulted in a beautiful volume and in a website where you have a PDF of the volume and where all the citations that have been used from the interviews have audio clips, partly developed by our other distinguished guest, Henk uh, van der Heuvel, audio clips. And you click on the audio clips, and you can actually hear the veteran 
it's the, and then you can hear and you see that there's a big difference between reading the transcript, the citation, and listening because if you listen, you can hear the intonation, sarcasm, irony, hesitation, and that has a very important added value for conveying the experience to an audience. Um, we have tried to do the same. Uh, it's a work in progress, Jakob, <laughs> with uh, uh, me together with Jakob, uh, with a, a collection of um, interviews from the Balkan Memories, in which we also have the visual dimension. And here we got also people from transitional justice and discourse analysis. And we are trying to create an, an article based on this uh, exploration of multidisciplinary research. And one of the first uh, tangible results of this cooperation is this article, which was included in the literary list which I sent, in which this is a, a, a collaboration between narrative psychologists and computer scientists. And they, they looked at the verbal and nonverbal content in a series of interviews and uh, the progress, the, 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 the differences in intonation, in tone and volume, and the negative and positive terms. And they compared it with each other. And this was published in the Journal for Digital Scholarship. Now, I'm going to my final uh, part of my presentation, and which is, um, it helped me very much at the beginning of my career in, 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 a digital, in a digital world to make a distinction between tools and applications in the various phases of the research process. Because if, if, you, if you don't have that in mind in the digital realm, uh, people who are new tend to mix up things and, because annotation, analysis, presentation, culture. So I, together with my colleagues, we created this overview uh, in which we make a distinction between tools that we need, technology that we need to identify useful material, to search for it in the broad sense, in the, in, in the nitty gritty sense, uh, and these are the available applications, and these are the people who have to come together to create these applications. And then the next phase is within a specific data set. You have your data set, you know what you want, and then you have to annotate it. You may want to share it, and then you have to analyze it. Count words, count size of um, map or, or tag certain meanings or, or certain perspectives. And that's, the, vis the, that's the, the, the analysis phase. And this is what you need of technology at this phase. And then you present a result. And that's the presentation phase, um, which also requires all kinds of tools. And finally, you have the data curation. Because in contemporary academic world, your data is always useful for someone else, and you're obliged to open it up and to make it fit for reuse. So um, this is opening up the archives, tools for structuring metadata, for identifying material. And I, I, I decided to include this overview after having looked at the diversity of the participants of the workshop, because I thought, uh, there has to be something in it for the different perspectives. And within this overview, I can see that people will recognize their domain and their expertise and their interest in having to do, getting into the oral history stuff by looking at these different phases. So the next one is tools for conversion, huh? because you have something in, in, in that uh, format, but your tool or your use to a different. So you have to have, for instance, with sound, you need conversion tools. You have annotation tools. And here we have the problem that we have a lot of proprietary annotation tools and analysis tools. I want to try and do better, but then open so that everyone can use it without all these different and difficult and complicated licenses that one university wants to pay and the other one doesn't. And um, collaboration and aggregation of data, getting the right sets of data together. And then, yeah, 
I, this is the last one. Tools for presentation, um, visualization for enhanced publication, like we did with the veterans' uh, publication, um, and finally for curation and reuse. And what we want to know from you is what's next. Be creative, think of it. This will be published on the website. You can look it down. And um, I'm very eager to know what comes out of this workshop tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.